The passengers of this Boeing 737 MAX 9 suddenly saw a whole wall section of their cabin just fall out minutes after their flight took off. How can such a thing even be possible? And is this another problem for the 737 MAX family? I got kids, I got grandkids, and so do you. This stuff matters. Stay tuned. It's still early days in 2024, but it's fair to say that this year hasn't started very well for the aviation industry. First, we had a terrible runway accident in Japan between an Airbus A350 and a Japanese Coast Guard Dash 8300 in which five people lost their lives. Now, I will probably take a closer look at that accident over on the Mentor Pilot channel eventually, once the final report is released. But then, only three days later, we also had the Alaska Airlines incident, which I will cover in this video. Now, fortunately, this debacle didn't involve any loss of life, which is why I'm talking about it even before we have the final report. But it now seems that some of the passengers actually required medical attention, which honestly is not that surprising. If you ask if I would fly Boeing again, I mean, it's a little hard to say right now because I'm pretty shaken up from what happened. Now, this is still an evolving story as we're recording this, so I might add the latest information coming out of the airline and the investigators at the end of the video. But if you somehow missed this story, it happened on the 5th of January 2024 on Alaska Airlines flight 1282. This was a domestic flight departing from Portland, Oregon in the United States with destination Ontario International Airport in California. On the day of this accident, the flight was operated using a Boeing 737-9, also known as a MAX 9. This particular plane, along with all other MAX 9s in Alaska's fleet, has seats for 178 passengers, and this is important for this story. The flight was almost full on that day, with 171 passengers and 6 crew on board, and after a 25-minute delay, the Alaska crew eventually took off using Portland's runway 28 left. They initially climbed out normally, making a left turn to the south down towards California, but shortly before reaching 15,000 feet, the flight crew got an indication of a sudden depressurization. According to some reports, the cockpit door was also blown open when this happened, but I am guessing that it was just the blowout panels who detached by design. After the first few seconds of shock, the pilots first donned their oxygen masks and then stopped their climb at approximately 16,300 feet and started descending down toward 10,000 feet according to their procedures. Meanwhile, the passengers who were sitting at the rear half of the cabin experienced something that must have been truly terrifying. A section of wall on the left side of the cabin, which included an entire panel with a window, had been simply blown out of the aircraft. This meant that what the passengers could see now was just a big hole surrounded by yellow insulation flapping around in the wind. Now this hole was actually a covered door opening which wasn't being used as a door on this particular aircraft and I will explain why later. But of course the poor passengers on this plane had no idea about this, nor did it matter. As far as they were concerned, this was just a normal wall with a window that had suddenly disappeared, now showing only the stars and city lights outside. The only way to tell this row apart from the others was the slightly bigger distance between the windows before and after this particular interior wall panel, but who would notice such a thing? Maybe you guys. I'll get back to the reason for that hidden door shortly, but first let's continue with what happened on the flight. As I said earlier, this plane had 178 seats, but the flight only had 171 passengers on board, and fortunately, the two seats closest to the now gaping hole were empty. Pictures of the cabin show that the headrests and seat padding from the couple of seats next to the hole were ripped completely off, and they were probably hit by the departing interior wall when the incident happened, and of course, the airflow across that gaping hole would have been, well, quite severe. Another fortunate fact was that since this aircraft had only climbed to around 16,000 feet, the pilots didn't have to make a screaming fast emergency descent in order to get down to 10,000 feet where everyone could breathe normally. Their vertical speed only got to around 2,000 feet per minute after the event, and their airspeed at the time of the cabin depressurization was 271 knots. Unfortunately, for the sake of all of the passengers who were sitting close to that gaping hole, the pilots didn't let the speed increase during the descent. This meant that at least things didn't get much worse for the passengers after that initial shock, but 
of course, their situation was bad enough already, especially considering that this was happening just after sunset on a cold January evening. The temperature on the ground in Portland was around 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so up at 16,000 feet at that speed, the temperature and wind chill would have been a lot colder. Fortunately, the ordeal didn't last for very long. The Alaska flight crew landed their 737 safely back down on runway 28 left about 14 minutes after they had started the descent. And the entire flight took only around 20 minutes. Now, the Boeing 737 MAX 9 used in this serious incident had registration November 704 Alpha Lima, and it was basically brand new. It had flown for the first time on the 15th of October 2023, and then Alaska Airlines took delivery of it on the 31st of October, putting it into service 12 days later. So, this plane had been in service for less than two months, meaning that it probably still had its new plane smell. Understandably, by the following day, long after this flight's passengers had finally made it to their destination on another aircraft, the repercussions of this story were just beginning. Both the NTSB and the FAA immediately started investigations, and Alaska Airlines announced that they were grounding all 65 77 MAX 9s in their fleet in order to perform full maintenance and safety inspections. By noon on the following day, they had decided that 18 77 MAX 9s could return to service since they had recently undergone some kind of checks, including inspections of those plug doors. But those jets didn't get to fly for very long, because just a few hours later, the FAA issued an Emergency Airworthiness Directive, or EAD, which called for all 77 MAX 9 aircraft with mid-cabin door plugs to be grounded. In the EAD, the FAA wrote that the aircraft must be grounded until the airplane is inspected and all applicable corrective actions have been performed using a method approved by the manager, AIR 520 Continued Operational Safety Branch, FAA. Because of this, Alaska had to check with the FAA to make sure that the checks that they had already made on their 737 MAX 9 fleet satisfied these requirements. Aside from Alaska Airlines, United Airlines also uses the 737 MAX 9s, 79 of them in fact, with more on the way. And of course, all of those jets were also immediately grounded with the same requirements. Now, the airlines could still reposition their aircraft if they needed to during the grounding, but only if they flew them with an unpressurized cabin. Now, other than Alaska and United, no other US airlines operate this particular MAX variant, but there are foreign airlines who do, and some of them do fly into the United States, but not necessarily with the same cabin layout. In Europe, EASA also adopted the FAA Emergency AD, even though there are no 77 MAX 9s operating in Europe with this cabin configuration. So, what does all of this mean? Is this another 737 MAX design issue, and how serious is it in that case? Also. What is actually a mid-cabin door plug, and is that the same thing as a deactivated door? Well, as the NTSB digs deeper into this investigation, their findings and the unfolding story around it will be meticulously covered by loads of different media sources, including today's sponsor, Ground News. With the media frenzy that follows news like this, it's sometimes really hard to evaluate the accuracy and content of all of those sources, but Ground News are excellent at doing exactly that. They will allow you to compare 50,000 different sources worldwide, spanning the entire political spectrum. So, let's use this story as an example, because this is where Ground News really shines. More than 250 articles were published on the Boeing Loose Bolt story, and Ground News will break down the political leaning of each source. In this case, we can see that the reporting is mostly coming from the center, and we can also see how the coverage spans across the globe, with international media presented next to local coverage. Let's take, for example, this center-leaning source from South Africa that emphasizes the focus on the door plugs, whilst a lot of other sources focuses on the loose bolts in general. Now, I've been using Ground News for a while now, and they've become a great tool for my team and I for unbiased research. So if you are passionate about staying ahead in the dynamic world of news, I highly recommend giving Ground News a try by using the link here below, which is ground.news slash mentor now. This will give you access to the pro plan for as little as $1 per month, or 30% off the Vantage subscription, but only this month. Now, 
In a recent video over on the Mentor Pilot channel, I had a quick look at another bizarre incident involving an Asiana Airlines Airbus A321, where somehow a passenger managed to open one of the doors in flight. Normally, doing this should be impossible in a pressurized aircraft, because the pressure differential means that the force required to move a door, well, is superhuman. But as I explained in that video, if the aircraft is flying really low, and if some other conditions are just right, it can actually be possible. But in this incident, the aircraft was not at low altitude, it was actually slightly below 16,000 feet, and just as importantly, as I've already mentioned, this wasn't done by a passenger who pulled the door handle, because there was no handle, and not even a door where this happened. Well, sort of. So at this point, we have to talk a little bit about door plugs and also different aircraft cabin configurations. All aircraft must have enough emergency exits to allow all passengers to safely evacuate the aircraft using half of the available exits in maximum 90 seconds. This means that the number and location of emergency exits required differ depending on how many passengers the aircraft is expected to carry. So for airlines that wants to use the 77 MAX 9 in a single class configuration, its maximum capacity is 220 seats. And the same goes for the 77-900ER of the next generation family, the older 737 variant. With 220 passengers, the aircraft would be operating at maximum capacity, so all available doors must then be active. That would mean on each side of the fuselage, one door at the very front, another one at the rear, two overwing exits, and just behind the wing, something called a mid-cabin exit, and those are the doors involved here. You see, if the seat capacity is much lower than the maximum, then these two mid-cabin exits behind the wing of the 727 MAX 9 can be either deactivated or plugged. And by the way, this isn't unique to Boeing aircraft. A lot of Airbus A321s have disabled mid-cabin exits as well for the same reason. In the United States, United and Alaska Airlines operate their MAX 9s with 179 and 178 seats respectively. Those numbers are actually below the maximum capacity of the smaller 727 MAX 8 and the same as the 727-800 that I fly. This means that United and Alaska Airlines can operate their 727 MAX 9s using only the normal doors of those smaller models, disabling those extra doors behind the wing. Now, as I've explained in many videos, including the one of the Asiana A321 incident, doors on airliners are generally designed so that the cabin pressure pushes them outward, securing them against the fuselage. In other words, either the door is actually bigger than the door frame and can't open without first pivoting and rotating, or it first has to slide vertically for a short distance to get around some obstacles in the frame in order to open. But what if those doors are disabled? Don't the same rules apply then? Well, actually, yes, they do. Because at least in the case of the 737, those disabled and blocked doors still have the same hinges and interface with the frame as the active doors do. You just can't see them from the inside. Now, in a 737 MAX 9, with all of its doors being active, these mid-exit doors are only used in case of an evacuation, and because of that, they open by swinging downwards, so the hinges are in the bottom of the door. But before the door can rotate out of the fuselage and then fall down, it first has to be lifted up by about 1.5 inches, or 3.8 centimeters, in order to unlock. There are 12 stop pins, 6 on each side of the door, and 12 corresponding stop pads on the frame. Lifting the door gets these 12 contact points out of alignment and allows the door to then rotate freely forward and down. These doors also have flight locks, which are electrical locks that stop them from opening in flight, and the function of these locks are monitored with warning systems inside the cockpit. But again, this is if the doors are activated and actually in use. On live doors, the door handles, one inside and another one outside the plane, are what's used to lift the door, making all of this opening possible. So what happens if the door is not in use then? Well, this is where we get to the difference between a deactivated door and a door plug. A deactivated door is basically a normal emergency door, with all of the mechanisms still in place, including the door handles, a small porthole window and a vent system. 
But this deactivated door is then completely blocked from the inside of the cabin. An additional panel is fitted on the inside, which takes up a little bit more space in the cabin, blocking the handle, the small portal window and the rest of the door. This, by the way, is the only way that you can tell if you're sitting next to a deactivated door, because you won't have a window then. But that's not what the Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9s are using. These aircraft are instead using something called door plugs. These are basically doors with the same hinge mechanism and the same 12 stop pins and stop pads securing the door against the frame, but they don't have any door handles. They also have large, normal-sized passenger windows, which is why passengers sitting next to them most likely wouldn't notice anything. The airlines usually prefer this setup, since it looks nicer with a full window, and I guess it probably also removes a bit of weight without that opening mechanism. However, on the flip side, if an airline uses a plug door and then changes their mind and wants to activate the door again, well, then they basically have to replace the whole door, which is a much more expensive process than just reactivating a deactivated door. But crucially for this story, if the door plug is used, well, then it is supposed to be locked in place with the use of four bolts, complete with nuts and lock wires, which secures the door plug in position and stops it from moving up and out of alignment with the stops. Access to those bolts and the whole door can be made from the inside of the aircraft once the interior wall panel is removed. Now, I want to really emphasize here that it's not these four bolts that directly keep the door from detaching from the aircraft. Instead, what they do is to stop the door from moving upwards and out of alignment with those 12 contact surfaces that I mentioned before. It is those surfaces that actually holds the load from the differential pressure inside of the cabin. So, what actually happened on Alaska Airlines Flight 1282 then? Well, this is where we have to speculate a little bit carefully, which I can do in this case, since there doesn't appear to be any serious injuries. And also, by the way, by the time that this video is released, we might actually already know the answer. Before I start to speculate, there is one more interesting fact in this story, which we heard about thanks to John Ostrauer and Will Gisbond in the air current. It appears that on at least two flights the day before this serious incident happened, crews flying this specific aircraft had received indications of pressurization issues. Alaska Airlines responded to this by changing this aircraft's flight schedule to make sure that it wasn't used on long overwater routes until maintenance had time to investigate these anomalies more carefully. By the way, this schedule change is something that Alaska itself decided to do as a precaution. It isn't a requirement by the FAA. But if we now know that the aircraft pressurization was having issues and we know that the door plug eventually detached, let's think about what would happen if those four locking bolts I mentioned earlier were either missing or faulty. Like I said, the door has to move upwards to come out of alignment, so at least in theory, the door's own weight should keep it down and in alignment, right? Well, it turns out that it's not that simple. The door's hinge mechanism incorporates lift assist springs, which are necessary when the door is actually active as an emergency exit to facilitate the opening. So it is conceivable that with the four bolts missing, the door could slowly start to creep upwards as the plane vibrates, maybe through some turbulence or something, coming out of alignment with the frame. This would likely initially cause a leak around the door seals and that could be the first indication of a problem, just like it had happened on those previous flights. But locating that leak would have been very difficult since the door plug was hidden behind the wall panel. Now there might have been some unusual sounds there, but unless someone specifically noticed that, it would have been really easy to miss. Remember, from the inside, there's nothing to suggest that there's even a door there. It's just an interior wall panel with a completely normal window. So with this in mind, missing securing bolts is a strong possibility, but there might be other reasons as well that I just haven't thought about, so we'll have to wait and see. Of course, the investigation into the story is now ongoing, and the NTSB announced that they have found the missing door plug, which will definitely help. They have also just recently confirmed that the door did slide upwards and disengage from the 12 stop pads on the door frame. 
The NTSB are currently investigating why this happened and they also found that the two guide tracks near the top of the door, who guides it when it slides up and down, were broken. But of course we don't know yet if that damage contributed to the departure of the door or if the tracks broke after the 12 stop pads and the stop pins disengaged from each other. We will have to see that as well. And by the way, as a complete side note, the NTSB also found a number of mobile phones that had been pushed out of the aircraft when the incident happened. And at least one of those was a completely intact iPhone, which had survived a 16,000 foot drop without even cracking. Now, if someone knows what phone case that it was using, then please put that into the comments. I want it. And while you're there, please like and subscribe the channel as well. Anyway, from the pictures of the aircraft after it landed at the bottom of the door frame, we can see the remnants of the door's hinges and bonding straps. We can also see a number of stop pads on the door frame of the fuselage, which doesn't appear to be damaged. The NTSB will let us know what damage they find on the corresponding part of the door itself, but meanwhile, it will be really important to see how many other 737 MAX 9s have missing or loose bolts in these door plugs. As we're recording this, both United and Alaska Airlines are reporting that some loose hardware has been found on some aircraft, but we have to be careful about those reports. We still don't know if these loose hardware are the same four bolts, nuts and lock wires that stop the doors from moving vertically. The NTSB also announced that they checked the right mid-cabin door plug on the incident aircraft opposite to the one that blew out and their first assessment is that it was correctly and securely installed. So, is this a problem specific to the design of the 737 MAX then? Well, the answer is likely no. Mechanically, this is a door and a door plug mechanism that Boeing has been using for years, including on the older 737-900ER models. Unfortunately, Boeing has had some recent quality control issues with the production of the 737, which I actually made a video about a few months ago. Spirit Aerosystems, a tier 1 Boeing supplier, had a key role in those issues and they make the entire fuselage of the 737, including those door plugs. So it is inevitable that some people are asking if this is now another issue involving that same company. But it is really too early to start trying to pin blame on anyone here. The interiors of Boeing aircraft are furnished at different times, with some of this work actually being done even before Boeing takes delivery of them. But, of course, ultimately, the buck always stops at Boeing. Even if the doors are installed somewhere else, it's Boeing's responsibility to verify that everything is in order. It's their name that goes on the side of the aircraft and they are the ones responsible for the quality and safety of the aircraft that they deliver to their customers. The fact that this happened to a MAX aircraft is very unfortunate for Boeing, which were probably hoping for a much more quiet start to 2024. Remember, they still aim to certify the 737 MAX 7 later this year and there is also the MAX 10 still to go. Finally, I have to give a huge shout out to Chris Brady at b737.org.uk and the Boeing 737 Technical Channel. That's for the incredible wealth of knowledge that he's putting out there regarding every possible technical aspect of the 737. You have to check him out for any nerdy 737 details that you've always wanted an answer to and a link to his channel in the description below. Now, if you want to stay on top of breaking news like this, visit my sponsor and download the Mentor Pilot app or check out mentorpilot.com. You can also check out this video about how the pilots would have flown the emergency descent and consider supporting the channel by sending a super thanks, buying a t-shirt or joining my awesome Patreon crew. We will be discussing this incident in a coming Patreon hangout. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.